Thanks everybody for coming out. Um, we would like to uh, just quickly go over a couple of concepts because like a lot of people had expressed to us earlier, uh, economics is for a lot of us like a really impersonal thing and I think the difficult part of getting into like anything new is understanding the lexicon or the fancy language that they use. Which is funny because lexicon is like super fancy language. <laughs> um, but let me go down here. Um, one thing that I would like to just first write up is the law of supply and demand. Does everybody know what uh, law of supply and demand is? Why don't you tell us? Yeah, yes, we can move to, to this side. All right, well, the, the uh, formal definition of supply and demand is a market model price determination. That is, in a really relatively unsophisticated light, prices of commodities fluctuate depending on demand. The neoliberal, neoliberal is a fancy way for saying capitalist in economics, uh, um, or neoclassical is also another word that they use. Um, uh, they'll often try and illustrate like these mathematical theorems, you know, of, of how to like prove supply and demand. But one thing that we should understand with um, with with any you know economic ideology or whatever is uh, uh, the fact that that ideology shapes how the theorem is interpreted. Does that make sense? So take supply and demand for instance. Supply and demand, if I you know, draw it out in like a perfect little picture for you or whatever, if that's the only thing I consider, then I can make a lot of very accurate predictions on production, on, on, uh, on you know, total supply and everything like that. Uh, but you know, as we'll see later, that's, that's not always the case. Um, so, would, do, just by like a show of hands, would it help if I were to put up like some supply and demand stuff? Yeah. Okay. Well, bear with me here. So, yeah, I've got a cheat sheet here. So, check it out. Let's do. So, if demand increases, and Demand. Demand. And d demand increases and supply stays the same, then it will lead to higher equilibrium equilibrium of uh, price and quantity. But what we'll see with um, uh, the housing crisis, once we go through like the actual illustration of, of this, is um, if supply increases, And demand goes down, then what happens? Any guesses? Prices go down. So let's do that. prices drop. And uh, uh, yeah, like I said, that's exactly what we see with um, the housing crisis. Um, and let's see. So, does anybody have any questions on supply and demand? No. Um, and the other fancy word that I'll be using is equity. Um, everyone's always talking about home equity, and like for me, you know, like looking at this, it was like, what are they talking about? But the uh, formal definition of equity is the value of an ownership interest in property, including shareholders' equity in a business. So this can be. Uh, you know, private homeowners uh, equity, or it could be a private investor's equity into the home, or uh, bank equity into you know mortgage rates, or what, whatever, whatever you have it. So is that sort of sort of clean up some some stuff? At least that's you know uh, some of the concepts that we'll be talking about. And Steve and I, the way that we wanted to structure things, um, you know, just as uh, the great Marxist that we are, or whatever. <laughs> Um, we uh, we always see you know a dialectical relationship between you know abstract sometimes in personal theory and the concrete illustration of this. So I'll, I'll be going over um, history, the housing market, and you know we'll just be kind of going in and out from there. So um, yeah, do you want to do you want to take it from here or okay, cool. Yeah. Um, 
I'm going to discuss the capitalist mode of production. It'll basically uh, be a lot of economy, um, and a lot of it will be stuff that, that Josh has covered. But the basis I want to set is how capitalism works, and to show that <clears throat> crises are internal to capital. Uh, in need-based economies, like uh, barter systems, there's no internal chaos in terms of crisis. Uh, there's always external threat because they're producing enough to use. They're producing what they need, or they're producing with a surplus that they trade uh, with others in an immediate community for specific needs, specific wants. Uh, the, the threat would be um, environment, another tribe, animals, etc. You're basically fighting the environment, and it's an external crisis in, in need-based economies. In capitalism, and what's so unique to capitalism, is that it produces its own internal contradictions, which result in overproduction, which result in crises, which result in economic devastation, and massive periods of exploitation for the working class. Not that capitalism is not always exploitative, uh, something, a minor thesis that will run throughout my lecture. But uh, what we want to focus on is the housing market and the history, and how what I am about to, to go into reflects concretely, and that's you know exactly what Brett meant by dialectical. I'll talk about the, the structure of capitalism, and then we'll provide the, the meat, the, uh, the actual examples in the housing market. So uh, yeah, with no further ado, um, the labor process of capitalism consists of two major components. The laborer who sells their value, and the capitalist who purchases that labor and sets it to work. The capitalist purchases the labor at a wage rate. The laborer works, creating labor power, and this produces a commodity, commodity that is disproportionately uh, valuable. It reflects a disproportionate value in terms of the work they put in and what the capitalist is able to sell it for. For labor to appear in a commodity, the labor must produce something of value, or that, that something has to be capable of satisfying some want. This is strictly uh, speaking use value. I know these are kind of uh, basic, so I'll try to hurry, hurry through them. But um, it's important to note that labor creates value in a commodity. The labor is, tr is treated as a commodity by the capitalist, and the end product is a, cap is, a, is a commodity on the market. But in the process of working on raw materials, turning them into a, a commodity, value is bestowed on that commodity. And when it's uh, abstracted in the money form, which we'll talk about a little later, um, it has a special contradiction in that money represents both the value of the object uh, and its, its use value, its appraisal, and its, its, its ability to be exchanged with other commodities. Um, so that's just kind of a primer for what will come in a little bit. But um, by shaping the material furnished by the earth, the capitalist has purchased, oh, that the material furnished by the earth, that the capitalist has purchased and placed before the laborer, the laborer creates a commodity with use value, a commodity that has value in its use. Use value is extended to anything that can be used, such as raw materials, instruments of labor, and most importantly for our, our analysis, the product which the labor produces. And it's important to keep in mind that use value has a whole chain, a chain that we will see get interrupted, creating uh, overproduction and crisis. Um, I won't get into that much more because I'll, I'll address it in a second. Um, so opposed to use value is exchange value. Exchange value is the value that product has in its exchange with something else. Again, with a need-based economy, uh, the exchange is both purchaser and seller in one interaction. We have an encounter, you want something I have, I want something you have, we exchange commodities, and in that one transaction, purchase and sell are united in one transaction. That's where we use the word. Uh, under capitalism, purchase and sell are separated. And it's this differenti uh, differentiation of sell and production, or sell and purchase, that causes internal problems for capital. So with the intent of driving profit from this production of total value, which is a commodity that has both exchange and use value, the capitalist purchases labor with two aims in mind. The first is that the capitalist wants to produce a use value that has value in exchange. So it wants to produce a commodity which someone needs that can be exchanged, as we've already talked about. That is to say, an article destined to be sold, a commodity. And secondly, he desires to produce a commodity whose value shall be greater than the sum of values that the commodity costs to produce. So the, the capitalist wants to produce something that they can sell for more than it's worth, or, or more than it costs to produce, not necessarily more than it's worth. 
In summation, the capitalist wants to produce a commodity that can be sold and exchanged for more than it costs the capitalist to produce it. Uh, his aim is to produce not only a use value, but a commodity, and not only just a commodity, but a commodity that is able to reflect surplus value, that is, reflect human labor. Okay, so quick recap, I'm kind of chopping through this, I'm sorry for the repetitive nature, but I'm just trying to lay it all out as quick as possible. Um, so to quickly recap the process, one, the capitalist wants to produce a use value, two, in the form of commodity, a commodity that both has use and exchange. That's important to capitalism because it's not just a strict one-to-one -one exchange as we see in need-based economies. Uh, three, that possesses value and exchangeability, and four, for less than the price the cap that the capitalist will sell the commodity for in the market. The increase of value in the product beyond what the product and the price of labor power cost is made possible by the transformative cap capabilities of labor power. The particular type of labor desired by the capitalist in order to turn a profit is that of surplus labor, because it is necessary for the generation of surplus value. To understand surplus value in its various forms, the concepts of necessary labor and surplus labor uh, must be further explored. And Josh already touched on these, so I'll try to, to do as much as I can. When I break it down I, or cut through choppily, I, I kind of don't make as much sense, so I might, if you guys will bear with me, read kind of word for word here. Do you want, would anybody want me to put like uh, definitions of use value and surplus up there? Because that's, I don't know, that's uh, kind of fancy. Does everybody get that? Okay. Cool. Perfect. Okay. So necessary labor is inextricably bound with the necessary labor time. Necessary labor time is the duration of labor necessary for the worker to provide for his own preservation and continued reproduction. So in a, la in a, in a working day, you have, let's say, the eight hour work day. It costs a total of, let's say, for being generous, five hours of labor for that the worker to produce enough value for the capitalist to have paid for their own existence. This is what's covered by what we'll see in the equation. Uh, I'll put it up so we can check it out. So you have variable capital, constant capital, the total cost of the capital, and what we'll see added to this in the equation will be surplus value. And all of this will be basically benefit, or, or we'll go straight to a capitalist straight to the capitalist. Um, so constant capital is the capital needed to maintain the mode of production, methods of production. That would be the raw materials themselves, uh, the machines that they purchase and use, the rent if they don't own their own land, um, the transportation equipment, all, all of the basic materials needed for day-to-day -day activity is the constant capital. Those are long-term investments for the capitalist and they reflect a rather stable portion of their overall cost. Variable capital, represented by the V, is uh, wages. Wages fluctuate with the social labor time. Um, I can get to that a little more. I, I know we have a pretty well-educated audience, so I won't go too much into it. If you guys have any questions about how wages fluctuate, um, you can ask me. Once we finish this, we'll open it up to questions before we discuss uh, crises explicitly. Um, so you have your variable capital, which is your wages, and so as the wages are factored into the commodity being produced, uh, the capitalist is covering his costs, factoring in all of these things, and the worker sets to work. So as we're working, you know, we're here, maybe a lunch break, then you, once you hit that five hour mark, you've basically produced all that you're being compensated for. And then what goes on here, this extra three hours, extra four hours, nowadays with the uh, mass assembly line, you probably only need to work something more like three or four hours uh, to really produce what you actually need and what you're being uh, uh, really paid for. Because again, keep in mind, it's not magic. You're being paid for eight hours, right? You're being paid hourly. Actually, he's factoring in your wage as variable capital in accordance with constant capital in accordance with the overall equation, which this will, uh, this is magic for the capitalist, but he'll sell it for this much. So as your eight-hour shift is being uh, set in terms of this equation, you actually only need to work for five hours to produce that much value in the product. Uh, that's kind of a tricky point. Does that make sense? The value you're imparting to the product is only five hours worth that accounts for your whole eight-hour shift. 
That's probably a better way to say it. So when you hit this five hour mark, you've imparted all of that value on the commodity by transforming raw materials into something that will be sold on the market. And then you work an additional three hours, basically for free, for your buddy the capitalist. This process of working extra time is the process of surplus value. What the capitalist has included in his nifty equation is covered for, and you're now generating this extra surplus value. And surplus value, uh, I'm not even going to, SB, is the process of exploitation. Um, quick question for the audience to keep you guys involved during this boring economic analysis. Why do capitalists go to the market? What is their aim? What is the benefit of capitalist production? Because in a need-based society, it's basically covered in the definition, we're providing our needs. Clothing, food, shelter, minimal recreation, maybe a glass of wine, maybe a beer for the Germans, uh, I don't know, pills for Utah Valley. Uh, but, right, so, so what's, the, what's the gist of capitalist, the capitalist mode of production? Why? What are, what are capitalists going for? What are they seeking? Profit. Profit. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's super simple. How are economies, uh, how, how do we tell if an economy is healthy? Right? An increase of domestic output or total revenues every year. Capitalism's job is to expand. It's to expand and expand and expand. The system is designed for continual growth, for continual revenue surplus. And where is that generated? It's generated by, it more looks like an SU. It's generated, it's generated in this process we talked about, which is surplus value. So when people say things like, and it always happens, capitalism's not necessarily bad. Capitalism's not necessarily exploitative, or we, capitalism, like we could do it better. Um, it's corporations, it's a few bad apples. How often do we hear the few bad apples? Um, you know, we can fix it, yada, yada, yada. The thing is, if we believe exploitation is a negative thing, it is inherent to the labor process of capitalism. The social, time of, the social time of labor required to produce a product, to impart something with value, is not the total labor time we work. And that extra part is the process of exploitation. And this is what we measure the success and productivity of our businesses by. It's what we evaluate countries by. Uh, no one, as we're all familiar, Cuba's got a much better standard of living in terms of life expectancy, infant mortality, right? But why doesn't anyone care? Their economy doesn't grow annually like, uh, like Columbia does. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah, precisely. Well, and, uh, if I could just add to that, I would say um, what I see with a lot of like neoclassical and capitalist apologists is people, is people who, um, you know, always talk about it being like human nature. And for me, I never talk about you know the greed of humanity or anything like that. To me, uh, um, this the capitalist mode of production, this the science of exploitation is why it's exploitative. And, and and of course, there's there's greedy people without a doubt. But it's not because of this innate flaw in human nature. It's it's, it's really scientific, at least in at least in my eyes. I don't know if I could just add that. Out, so. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, so, having kind of driven this home, necessary to capitalism, this is what capitalism is all about. And it's also the very process of exploitation. Therefore, capitalism, exploitative, by necessity, internal to its very structure, exploits human beings. Now, I'll quickly talk about two ways uh, that capital does this, because these are also really important for overproduction. These are actually internal processes that, while helping capitalism, almost not even almost, they set the abstract uh, circumstances, the possibility for overproduction and crises. Uh, so these are absolute surplus value and relative surplus value. Um, absolute surplus value comes by simply lengthening the workday, which since the 1960s, uh, I think it's the 1970s, we've seen a gradual increase every year in the time worked weekly by American citizens. That's just not across the world, which I'm sure is a lot worse, but right here in America, the 40-hour work week has been chipped away year after year. I know my parents work 60 plus. Uh, I'm a part-time worker and I work more than part-time. Uh, and I'm sure most people in the room do as well. 
Um, and that's absolute labor time. They just simply say, you know, you've done us this, we'll now do us more, or we'll fire you, et cetera, et cetera. And just a quick note, in times of crises, like we're saying with massive unemployment, we are actually seeing worse hours. You are seeing people revert back to almost 24-hour shifts at call centers, where now they have people working, uh, you know, new, like, uh, what is it, noon to six, and then from six uh, to midnight, and from midnight to noon again, and you have three different shifts, and they're just pumping out people working around the, around the clock. Um, you get much more shifts that are even blatantly over 40 hours, you're working full time, and you'll be working 50, 60 hours, and you're being you know, paid hourly, uh, and they just expect you to deal with that because you need jobs, and it, it's tough out there, we're fighting for them. Well, I, if I could just um, add, uh, I think within a recession, particularly the one that we're in, the, uh, the amount of exploitation is actually greater Simply because if uh, if you know the top quintile of income distribution, if the richest people in the nation, if their uh, wages stay the same, and um, everybody else has to do twice as much work, and their real their actual wages are worth less in the actual marketplace, then I mean, do, do you do you see exactly what I'm saying? The rate of exploitation is greater in a crisis. So I don't know if I. If I could just keep adding points around. Yeah, keep doing it. Okay, keep, cool. Because I think I, I drone on and start repeating myself. Yeah. Um, so, and then relative surplus value, on the other hand, is the curtailment of the necessary labor time from the corresponding alteration in the respective length of the two components of the working day. Uh, so that's necessary and surplus labor. So what's done in that diagram I had up, um, Instead of the, the, uh, the traditional system where like, we're working five hours, which we need, and then providing the extra three, well, we develop new machines. We develop new ways of producing material more efficiently, more effectively, in larger quantities. And then it's the same hour workday, but now with the new equipment, the new technologies available, you really only need to be working four hours a day. And through the advancement in uh, efficacious technology, capitalist has smuggled in an extra hour of surplus labor where you're still working you're still churning out products commodities for the capitalist but now providing an extra hour for free so that's both absolute and uh, relative uh, surplus value do you guys have any questions on that at all okay perfect on um, the process of exploitation outlined here is the process of labor necessitated by capitalism the division of labor, the privatization of the means of production, and the commodity form all impose labor divisions that facilitate the necessary surplus value dichotomy, that, like the necessary surplus value dichotomy that I, I've already talked about. Um, so that's all I wanted to touch on in terms of classical uh, Marxist economics. To turn to crisis theory, um, what we'll see in the housing market, specifically con or concretely, is that Crises occur in the circulation of capital. Circulation of capital can be represented CMC or, or MCC, or MCM, sorry, um, where commodities are transformed into money by the capitalists. They produce something, right, and then sell it. And then they take that money and then reinvest it in capital, right? And then this chain will repeat itself. I mean, it, these are just two smaller ways of right. This goes on indefinitely. Capitalist has money, they invest it, they get more money. Then they invest it, right? And we see this today in really frightening ways where one corporation can own multifaceted uh, avenues of uh, revenues. Um, they monopolize markets through owning smaller corporations or owning different banks. And those are, are different investments. In Marx's day, it was a little more straightforward where you had. Uh, this chain was actually by the same company, right? They produce a commodity, then they get their money, and then they reinvest it in themselves to keep producing. I mean, not to say Marx didn't see the rise of imperialism, he did. But today we have money produces commodities, and then those commodities are sold for money, and that money is taken and can be reinvested in any imaginable industry, be it in chemistry or in chemicals, be it in oil, natural gases, uh, or other people's currencies. We saw massive, massive investment in uh, the Iraqi Din dinari? I think that there was a, a lot of American investment in Iraqi currency because right, we were the ones propping it up. We still are. Um, so 
just keep in mind that the reinvestment of capital can be in, in almost anything you can imagine. But so, crises and overproduction, as we'll see, develop when there is a break in, or a gap in some part of the chain of reproduction. So, capitalism, for instance, as we talked about relative uh, surplus value, will generate new ways of efficiently producing more commodities, more value for the capitalist. Now, if they're able to produce much more efficient ways and produce much more things than they were previously able to do in a shorter amount of time, as, as Brett already pointed out, you'll have more commodities on the market, which drives down prices. Now, if prices, if consumption doesn't match the prices, you're going to have a lag in production. You're going to have a small crisis. And a small crisis of capitalism is precipitated down the entire investment chain. Uh, if we're talking about uh, the production of computers, you're also talking about extracting the minerals needed. You're talking about petrol, which goes into a lot of the plastics, and the computer chips. But you're talking about a series of different raw material providers who all sell to different markets, who then assemble certain parts. You have your Intel processors. You got your actual computer, be it you know Dell, uh, HP. So all these are sold to different products until that commodity is sitting on the shelf. And a break in the chain of underconsumption reverberates through the whole chain, uh, especially today where most investments are made on credit. Whereas I get all my uh, plastics from Zach and I give him basically a, a coupon, not a coupon, an IOU uh, in credit on, for a six month production period, and I waive my revenues to repay you. Uh, if I don't get that money, I can't pay you. I have no money. You have no money. You can't pay the raw material producer. And that makes sense, right? It, it, they stack up on each other. Um, so that's that's relative surplus value. Do you have uh, or I, in, in relative surplus? I, I don't have any additions to that. But if, if, do you want to go into the, the history of the... Yeah, like, do you have a couple of things? We wanted to talk about the monetary form. Oh, and oh how, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go with how that stuff. Uh, so quickly, money um, as an interesting medium between commodities. Instead of the need-based economy where we have, uh, again, us exchanging products, uh, purchaser and seller all in one, um, money divides the, the process of purchasing and selling. And it also separates them in place and time. Uh, we buy from China on the internet, separated by an enormous distance, and they've produced those products in mass in an assembly line in, in a manufacturing warehouse, and they're sitting there, stockpiled, waiting for my purchase or, or you know Brett's purchase. And the, the gap in time and money means that the capitalist has to sit on that in some sense. And they have to they have to sit on what they've produced, and if it's not meeting a, a demand that's buying and making it a lucrative investment, they start losing money. Um, and the monetary form actually works against capital. I, I think, is that cl clear? Do you guys have a, any questions on that? I've kind of talked a lot, so I'll, I want to give it over to Brett. But the, the contradiction of purchase and sell creates the possibility of contradiction. And as people stop buying, we see crises. Absolutely. Um, well, I would just like to say, uh, if you don't get anything out of this lecture, let our, let our thesis be, be really clear, and that is um, uh, know that overaccumulation is the end result of capitalist modes of production. And as a concrete illustration, um, uh, legislation that uh, was passed made it possible for an oversupply of, um, of houses and um, and of uh, equity that went to uh, subprime home buyers. Subprime means that their credit score wasn't that good, um, but you know the private investor or the bank or whomever sold them said house gave it to them anyway because of this deregulation that was passed circa 2002 under, under Bush. Um, Okay, so it's relevant to note that um, culturally, the United States has a huge obsession with, with owning houses. In fact, 65 or 66% of all homes in the U.S. are home-owned, rather than 
you know, rent it out or whatever. Um, and uh, like I said, right around 2002, uh, you have these huge deregulative policies under Bush. And it's interesting because um, in the last 45 years, you see uh, housing, actually if I can get that this, that's a, okay. Did everybody get that uh, CMC, MC, MCM? Um, the last 40 years, say starting in 1960, you'll see that um, uh, the amount of houses is kind of going like this, and you get some more, and then you'll have a little slump here, right? It, but right when you get to 2002, they skyrocket, and you know this is this is great. Everyone's getting houses, and it's the new housing bubble, like. There was this myth around the time that you know housing prices will never go down. It's fantastic, right? But what's interesting about this this curve is um, this is the overaccumulation. There is too much supply of houses, and this, um, uh, of course, if everyone has a house, no one has too much of a demand for a house, so prices soar down. And uh, uh, in combination with the um, with all of the subprime mortgages they, they were giving out to basically everybody, no one can pay their house. These houses flop, and so the houses are turned to you know uh, whoever sold the house, namely private investor or or a bank. Um, and what's interesting with this, if if you can compare two of the graphs, oh, uh, just as a partial side note, take a side step. Every 10 or, or uh, uh, 15 years, you'll see marks of, here, let me use, a, use, use green. Um, you'll see slumps in, um, slumps in the housing market. And it's interesting because these slumps, these depressions, arguably, simply just rec they, they uh, uh, register on a macroeconomic level, that is nationwide, on a big level. Um, that there's, there's overaccumulation, but it also signifies, I think more importantly, how integral the, uh, the housing market is to the rest of the economy. Like Steve was saying, this has uh, a domino effect on, on, the rest of the, on the rest of the economy. Um, but check this out, this is what's really interesting, tying into Steve's uh, awesome comments about use value and exchange value. Um, you can kind of see uh, vacancy rates, which is, you know, houses being empty, kind of correlating like this, and every time you'll have a depression, like, vacancy rates will jump up every time, and then it'll kind of go back, you know, once capitalists take advantage of said crisis to reinvest their capital in cheap labor, shoot up again, blah, 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 blah. But what's interesting with the uh, 2002 model, you see, an overaccumulation that we've never seen before, and that this is the crisis. Right, or, not around 2002. Everyone cites 2008, um, but it was it's more of a, a, a fluent process than that. We're looking at. Um, well, I don't want to delete it. No, no, you can yeah, get rid of it. It just looks cool. You know, it looks fancy. <laughs> um, so, I would say 2000. 2005 to 2008, and everyone, everyone see that? Um, that's right when you see uh, a huge jump, not only in housing prices, because again, like I said, we had more houses than we'd ever seen on the market, but right around here, you see a huge jump, um, uh, well, it would be more like that, right? Right at 2005 and 2008 of vacancy rates going. What does this mean? This means we have more homes than we've ever had before, but we don't have anybody living in it, right? That's what's crazy. That is the, that's what, you know, Marxists say in like a really generic form. That's the contradiction between use value and exchange value, commodities. Um, so, can I just Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Go so just to, to put all the economic diagram CMC stuff, uh, when, when the capitalists, uh, or, or when capital has new value to re, uh, reinvest, they find, as we've already talked about, a lot of new markets. And in 2002, as the housing market really began to boom, you had a lot of people owning three or four houses that were then turning around and selling them for more, putting maybe five or $6,000 of renovations into them, selling them for $25,000 more. Um, this happened a ton in Vegas. 
Uh, my uncle did that a lot. <laughs> um, and uh, you saw a lot of investment in the housing market, but as everyone's putting their money into it, as everyone's starting to reinvest the capital, you have underconsumption. And that's, that's again, a, a typical, as we've already talked about, a process of, of overproduction and, and crises, is that they're producing all these houses because they have them all lined up, they're turning them out, uh, the, the, uh, the wood is in stock, the nails are in stock, the labor is cheap. Um, you know, they're turning out houses, especially in warm places like, uh, like Arizona and Las Vegas where the housing market was hit the worst. You have year-round uh, uh, construction because you don't have massive slumps from the winters. Uh, so as they're turning all these houses out, you get people not buying. And from 2002, when this starts, to 2005, 2008, you have three or four years of capitalists over-investing in this part of the economy and people not buying. And it literally takes years for this to catch up with the fact that we have all these homes that no one's living in. And then when that bursts, it, it, it reverberates through the entire economy. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, but in, in, just in regards to the uh, housing crisis, it's also important, just as a side note, to include um, the credit crisis. Like if you get on YouTube and you search housing crisis, uh, just to like learn about stuff, um, at least I found there were a lot more videos that talked about uh, the crisis of credit. But that's just really, uh, at least as far as I interpret it, and I'm no, I'm no expert. Um, uh, I think those are the, that's reading in between the lines. Do you know what I'm saying? If I go and I want to uh, buy a house, I have to take out a loan. I have to get credit, right? And the fact that all of these people were buying these homes, they were flopping on that credit, but, you know, Bush being the awesome, you know, neoclassical proponent as he was, this causes a devastating effect, not only with private investors and private, uh, you know, homeowners, but banks as well. And it ties into, you know, the reason why you have all of these uh, companies who have stock in the in these banks, or the banks that have stock in the, the companies as well, having to bail out on the backs of working class, you know, the working class nationwide. Because it's important to know, after the U.S. goes out, you've got the rest of the world going out. We live in a global economy. And uh, anyway, um, you just see how complicated the process is. Sorry, just, yeah. Yeah. Quick comment. The yeah. reason I didn't really mention credit a whole lot is credit is another investment avenue for uh, capitalists. Take that extra, take, take your extra uh, money from your commodities and you can actually reinvest that in banks. Give banks larger credit banks to give more people credit. You're actually investing in an interest rate, you're actually investing in other people's credit, you can buy credit packages, um, and yeah. it's just, credit is an extension of a, a capitalist market. Yeah, perfect. Um, oh, let's see, let's see. Oh, right, so uh, you see the exploitation happen in, in two senses. Um, you, you see uh, over-exploitation because of the crisis. Uh, all the while, you still have the standard mode of production where you go to work every day and you get paid half of, of what your, label, your labor actually creates. Um, so that's, that's really going into some of the history, like about the history of crises. The history of crises. Well, I know that in, in um, 2008, uh, Bush, passed uh, the biggest um, bill increasing the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, what is it, the debt ceiling. And it was the biggest thing since the New Deal in Roosevelt, or since the 1930s, which you know, Roosevelt did with the New Deal. Um, and this is hugely indicative of uh, the uh, un unpredictability of the market. I mean, you have all these theorems, like I said, that you can prove mathematical, like, uh, uh, formats like, look, this, this makes sense, we can save the economy, it actually disrupted it, caused greater debt than, you know, uh, Roosevelt uh, had, with, you know, with some differences between the two bills in comparison, but the same principle is there, so, um, anyway, uh, that's, I should tie it into the, the auto, just one more example, real quick, um, is the, the auto market, which we saw collapse as well, along the same time, um, and what's interesting about that is that you actually had, uh, the U.S. dominated the auto industry after World War II, 
which uh, eventually as Japan and Germany, uh, the two major producers right now, were able to buy new machines and buy, uh, as they were able to buy new constant capital to produce these automobiles, we saw the market start to expand where profits uh, actually shrank and prices went down because there was more production, which uh, US companies couldn't compete with because their constant capital, their factories were outdated. And what happened uh, when it finally caught up with this and the auto bubble burst, I think before 2002, uh, GMC had to shut down two plants, Chrysler shut down plants, Chrysler's part of GMC. But you saw the auto industry hit in the exact same way, which was a part of just the capital system. Someone had newer constant capital, uh, they were able to produce more, cheaper, and the monopoly the US had after World War II was slowly caught up with and usurped, and then we saw the market fail. And the key to all these things is that without a planned economy, you have capitalists doing everything they can in the relative surplus uh, market to lower their cost of production, to increase outputs, there's no exact specifications for who's buying all of this shit. Excuse my language. Um, who, who's going to buy all the commodities? Who's going to purchase these things and keep the economy healthy is, is a question completely absent from a, a, a free market economy um, where you know the working class is supposed to bail them out after, after Absolutely. Yeah, and to add on that, um, you know, uh, Steve and I we're not we're not mutualists uh, by by any means. I don't I don't just advocate just a barter system, even though it's a, a move to uh, uh, you know uh, you know a need based economy or whatever. But I think um, uh, if money is collapsed, just as a partial side note, I mean, if you want to make some qualifications, throw it at me. But I think um, historically, when we see money, which is just a universal, you know, medium to exchange other commodities, you see that abolished. You see the you see the rest of the economy collapse. This is exactly what happened uh, 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 with the Pol Pot regime. The entire economy collapses because they accept, you know, this this sort of system of exchanges. And so, on a historical note, it emphasizes the uh, the uh, the role of essentially economy, I, at least at least I think. You know, I don't know. Maybe you have some different views, or I don't know what you know, Jacob thinks or whatever. So, well, um, before we, I think we'll do breakout groups, or I think since it's a smaller group, we'll probably just discuss before going to solutions. But I just wanted to emphasize uh, a final point in, in terms of how capitalists solve the problem, and that is uh, the devaluation. Uh, crises are basically the devaluation of a market. They've produced too many goods, be it too many houses, too many cars, too many McDonald's toys, and instead of distributing those to people in need, which would have no profit, or like the bridal dresses, I don't know if you guys saw that um, happen last month. Uh, there was a major a retailer in New York, I, I just saw it on the news as I was passing through um, an airport, so I don't know all the, the specific details, but there were all these uh, bridal dresses that a, a, a shop couldn't sell, and they actually went under. And instead of giving these to charity, instead of turning these over in any sort of way, um, the, the bridal shop had bought private contracts with all the designers. So by contract, they had to take these bridal dresses, brand new, unused, and paint red, just smear red paint on them before throwing them away to guarantee they were unsalvageable. That is the kind of devaluation that capitalism does. They shut down plants, they lay people off, but then they bulldoze houses that people need. They stop producing food people need. Uh, yes, the, on, that, on that same note, if I, if I can say so, yeah. I mean, everyone names the, the famous example where they were actually burning grain during the, the Great Depression. Absolutely. So, the, right, their the supply would go down, prices would go up, and this would be uh, a stimulus package. So, I think it's just, just to add on there. Yeah, so. absolutely. Just to close it out, then, uh, yeah, that's a crisis is a mass devaluation. Capitalists have produced enough value, and then when they can't control it any longer, they begin a process of violent devaluation of the market to shrink the markets, to rein in value, and then to find secure investments for the future. Uh, perfect. Yeah. Sorry, I, I did. I was uh, not paying as much attention as I should have been. But um, obviously, uh, you guys do agree that there was a crisis of production during like the Great Depression, or that foreshadowed the Great Depression. Um, 
and we were obviously able to counteract that. Um, do you think we'll be able to, and this is kind of throwing you guys a, a ball, but I'm just interested to see what you're going to throw back at me. Um, but do you think we'll be able to recover from what I see as a crisis of overproduction currently, um, and why or why not? Take that, or you want me to take it? Why don't you take a shot at it and then I'll finish it? Well, I, I would say um, it's interesting, as um, uh, you know, a lot of like typical Marxist ideology would commonly state uh, the economic often precedes the political. You know, everyone hears that generic term, the, oh, the economic precedes the political. But I, I, I think it's a dialectical relationship. But uh, nonetheless, the depression. Uh, in 2008 still emphasizes a lot of uh, a, a, an immense amount of political turmoil, namely the Occupy movement. It's interesting that um, you know as of late, at least as far as I know, mostly on the East Coast, Occupy has taken a turn to focus on on occupying vacant homes. And that's fantastic. It seems like it's another step to be taken. And you know, I, I have uh, I think modest criticisms of, of Occupy, but um, I, I would say if it's going to be the battle of whether or not we can take advantage of this highly opportune moment to show how exploitative capitalism is on a systemic level, not just on a moral level, like we should buy, you know, we should buy organic and buy Toms and everything, um, uh, but how we should actually challenge the, the base contradiction, which is the contradiction between use value and exchange value. So I, I don't know. That's that's those are a couple of my personal thoughts. It's it's also incredibly important to know um, uh, with the crisis you see higher inequality. This is a partial. I feel like I just have to like throw in there real quick. Um, but with a lot of like these vacant homes, you don't see too many like gated communities right being shut down. You see. Uh, blacks and Latinos and Chicanos and uh, in regards to the Occupy movement I would uh, at least hope for a, um, although admittedly as you know I haven't been involved as, as I like to with Occupy I, I would like to hope to see um, more uh, self-determination and involvement from minority groups instead of just middle class of white guys <laughs> right, yeah, right I don't know so I, I don't know, Jacob. Those are some of my thoughts. Just I, I do. Was that a? It was. What do you think? It was helpful. Just to refocus my question. Yeah. Uh, do you think the material conditions uh, that preceded the Great Depression and the resulting effects, the resulting liberalization, things like that, do you think those material conditions are significantly different than the material conditions now? Do you think there's going to be like a different response to this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, the, a big thing would be the environmental movement. Um, it, after the Great Depression and, and during the New Deal especially, the idea was that there's this, this great abundance of energy and resources in the world, right? And what we need to do is harness it and tap it. And we saw large service projects for dams, for road systems. It was basically the, a move to harness the world. Where now we've started to realize that we're rapidly depleting the world's resources, probably more so than our, our most honest statistics would, would indicate. And I think uh, the material conditions are entirely different uh, in the sense that we're aware of what we're doing. And there are a lot of different movements in terms of material consumption that I think are entirely unsustainable. I think most of us think are entirely unsustainable. And the, the general populace uh, of first world countries at least are aware of. Um, for me, though, yeah. Well, just just on that same note, uh, David Harvey remarks, and he has he has a couple of videos about uh, uh, the crisis of capitalism. But he remarks something fascinating, uh, especially in regards to like uh, doing a, a historical parallel to the 1930s. Um, capital was able to externalize its problems, right? Just just in regards to the whole environment uh, uh, comment. There's not. I mean, is, if someone else wants to point out to me, there's not a single country that hasn't been touched by imperialism or, say, a country that you know, has resisted it. I mean, there's no, there, there simply are no natural resource to, resources to externalize capital on now because 
we live in a globalized economy where you know from uh, World War II and all of the entire Cold War, it's it's a mad grab for for resources. You know. But, and I just so quickly I before just, we go to Brian's question, um, last thing is I do think the material conditions are ripe for social change. And I mean, to quote one of my favorite films, right? Crises precipitate change. It's Kurtz from Apocalypse Now. Um, <laughs> the thing is, how is it going to change? That's, and that's really always been the revolutionary the question is the material conditions, the objective circumstances seem ripe. And, and with things like the Occupy movement, I look to them more as an indication of class consciousness. More people than ever are aware of the exploitation, more people than ever are seeing the disparities, the injustices. The abuses, not just of human beings, but it's the environment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I think it's the, the structure, the form might be perfect, but is the content, the subjective content, ready to to carry on and change things? Um, I think things will change one way or another. How will they change? That's our question. I suppose. Right. Um, it kind of goes along with this, and without making this drag on like it needs to. Uh, I'm just curious because you said like all right now that we're aware that we're like exploiting all the world's resources, um, and, like we're aware that we're doing that as opposed to like during like after the Great Depression we're like all right let's just harness it. Um, so like we're harnessing the world's energy um, like then and now we're like aware of it but we're still doing it like now just as much if not more. Um, what's the difference? Like just because we think it doesn't make any different. No, no. Well, I mean for me the difference is. Consciousness. It's more people starting to realize and be honest with themselves about the way things are. Um, that, that might not be super satisfactory because I wholly agree. It's like, you know, my dad thinks he's green because he drives a hybrid car or something, but he would have been much greener to have bought a used car, right? Like we're, we're still stuck in this consumptive mentality. We're very much um, still pillaging the earth at record rates. And capitalism's still trying to find new technologies to pillage the earth. It's not as if as if we've really changed our, our course. But what I do think is, just by having something like a green movement, as off base as it might be, indicates that there is a popular support for the idea that needs to be driven home in much more critical, revolutionary, or revolutionary terms, I, I believe. But I think that it definitely indicates something that the pop, that in, in pop culture consciousness, uh, we're starting to take into account the world and our effect on it. Um, Could that also be a little bit detrimental to have a green movement and have it kind of like directed in a way that doesn't really help and makes people complacent? Absolutely. And I think we need a vicious critique of, of the green movement. I don't think any revolutionary should be out there championing hybrid cars. Um, it's... A second, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I, I think here, here's, it, for the pop culture critique and, and of current conversations, there's a South Park episode where everyone buys uh, you'll like this, I promise. There's a South Park episode where everyone buys hybrid cars, right? But then smug starts to set in after George Clooney's Oscar speech. Um, because everyone's so smug about now having, uh, you know, hybrid cars. And they're all kind of acting like assholes. And, and then the message at the end of the story is, you can still own hybrid cars, and hybrid cars are a good thing, but you just shouldn't be so smug and pompous about it. And that's wholly the liberal, just... I can't say enough derogatory things about yeah, the there, wrong message. There's nothing more liberal than individuals focusing on consuming the right products. Yeah, yeah, that, and by 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 every definition. And anyway, no, well said. <laughs> yeah, that that that's the whole reason for the story. Is that sort of liberal consciousness of like, don't just be a jerk. Be a cool person. Like, be green, you know, and like, grow some dreads and drive a hybrid. <laughs> like. No, 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 a hundred times no, and we need, to be, we need to be enforcing that, we need to be saying that, we need to be you know, keeping our own minds open while criticizing the movement. Um, but I do think in terms of water, food, and energy, um, the world is, uh, the global economy is vastly uh, uh, reaching an impasse. Uh, billions of people aren't going to have any sort of drinkable water in the next 10 years. That's going to be a massive struggle. And it's going to be on us to not close borders and turn to military tactics. Uh, it's going to be a subjective response that determines the course of our actions in, in those circumstances. But uh, 
I think the environment for me, and, and it kind of sounds like maybe for you as well, is going to be the big limitation that we need to address. And that might even help people. Um, I don't know, I have my own complaints and concerns though. But I, is that anything I'll follow up on? Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I think why the material conditions now are different is not so much the culture and like our difference in culture, but it's the material conditions, the material um, abilities of the government and of capitalism to respond to this crisis. Um, obviously, they were able to respond to the crisis of the Great Depression differently with, uh, you know, different kinds of uh, betting on our future financially uh, and, uh, you know, rebuilding uh, Europe um, after World War II, things like that. Um, and I don't think they have those available to them now. Um, and so why I'm, why I'm questioning, I, I don't know if I say that the culture is not significantly different now than it is, than it was during that capitalist crisis. I think they are different, but I don't think that's, it's different in like a progressive way. It's just different, different as in different as in uh, people are different now. Um, and and uh, while I, I think the culture is going to become fundamentally revolutionary and class consciousness is going to arise, I don't think it's there yet. I think it's going to happen because of capitalism not being able to recover from this capitalist crisis and, and a downward spiral. Um, and because of that spiral, it's going to happen. I would say that if we point out things like, oh, well, people are green now, or they're uh, you know, environmentally aware, during the Dust Bowl, which preceded the Great Depression, people became extremely environmental, and they had more reason to be. People started talking about national forests. There was a huge push for uh, new agriculture. I mean, people were made way more aware. That didn't mean they were revolutionary. Um, and so while I agree those are different, they're on par with each other, and I wouldn't say that's like the defining thing for me. It's less about, and I don't know if this is quite a superstructure versus, you know, base conversation, but the superstructure right now is only being determined by the material conditions, and the material conditions are not drastic enough that we'll have class consciousness. And so where I was going with the question was wondering if you do agree that um, this time there's high, uh, not like it's not for sure, but uh, that there is a possibility that they will not be able to uh, recover from the capitalist crisis like they were able to during the Great Depression, that it might be more detrimental to them. Yeah. Totally. Well, I, I would say, at least, at least how I tried to explain my position, it's not because of you know, uh, the cultural aspect of the superstructure of capitalism, that we have all this resistance. Uh, I, s I don't see it improving because unlike the 1930s, the economy can't externalize its problems. Uh, like, like Brian said, I, I, the natural resources are dwindling. There are no productive relations if there's no production itself. You know, so I, I don't know, that's my, that's my only comment. But, but the details uh, of which, I mean, that, I don't know. I, so I, I turn uh, specifically to the, to the ideological apparatus uh, and of what you call culture, um, because I thought, uh, like, we'd done so much on the economy. I wholly agree, and it's the, the, the basic Marxist tradition, or, uh, position. You have the productive forces, right, and the relations of production. And the internal contradiction of productive forces that have a, a capacity uh, to be used appropriately or adequately, and uh, to produce enough to be sustainable, et cetera, et cetera, in contrast with an ideological, and I would say today, pervasively a na nation state apparatus. Um, what I think is perhaps the most important for a revolutionary students union like we are um, is this sort of ideological critique, and that's why I turn there. But I absolutely believe the material conditions are different than the Great Depression and will not support the sort of bounce back. Um, as Brett said, you can't devalue foreign currency anymore. With a, with a global market where capitalism has, has globalized the world and has invested wherever it can, when you have a global collapse, people start devaluing money and trading money. And what you try to do is basically take the burden of devaluation 
and place it on someone else. And we saw this happen in 1997 um, with the uh, the Asian collapse. It was the first time the Asian markets, uh, which had recently been so robust after the collapse of the Soviet Union, right, and China, um, start to, to fail heavily. But it was also because Asian currency was being devalued the heaviest. Um, United States was shifting a lot of the currency blame on the Philippines, uh, a convenient outsource, you know, Laos, et cetera, et cetera. So as, as we export our problems, we're seeing more repercussions because the world is so intimately connected. I don't know if that makes sense, and we can talk, because... No, you hit it right there, okay. so that, right was, that was why I wondered. And that's yeah. definitely relations of production and productive forces, and the productive forces right. uh, are given a lot of more trouble. And But I, I don't know, the relations, I think, are, are so essential, and I think the ideological state apparatus really needs to be challenged, because at the same time that we're having Occupy movement, at the same time we're having a lot of leftist or, or more progressive um, demonstrations. We're having the Tea Party. We're having you know neo Nazis really start to to reemerge. Uh, and when we see that sort of uh, super conservative or ultra conservative reaction, I, I think that's going to be addressed more on the ideological than the productive forces level. But that's coming from a white male standing in a university who doesn't have to worry about food, water, and shelter. <laughs> Whereas I'm a firm believer that in the third world or in developing countries, um, developing countries, excuse the language, um, that they're going to have a much more revolutionary class consciousness because they're struck with the, the daily relations that are so intimate to the forces of the production that we overlook and, and, and sort of absorb ourselves in commodity fascism. That makes sense. Sure. As soon as you started drawing uh, productive forces and, 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 and that, I was just like, that is exactly what I need. That's um, just as like, I don't know, a closing remark, you'll see a lot of private companies just um, in regards to uh, housing prices and what it, looks, what it looks like now, so you have the depression, just, just as a quick side note, you'll have them go up and down and like this. And anytime you have one of these massive upticks, they're like, oh my god, the economy is going to improve. Uh, but, but it can't, there's no way to get over uh, over accumulated houses of these empty homes uh, unless you know there is something radically uh, you know that's, that is restructured both economically and culturally you know like I said owning a house is like this huge thing in Switzerland like, like in the US 66% uh, of all homes are, are home owned in Switzerland it's like 22 so I don't know just as a just as a closing mark, you we know. have actual graphs that are like legitimate. <laughs> and we <laughs> you can email them, them or, or or give you them. It's not it's not just board squiggles. We do have legitimate data. <laughs> yeah, you guys out there too. We have legitimate data. We can email you. Um, yeah, and actually, we uh, be before this, I, I was trying to get my computer to work. I couldn't get the the graphs printed because I wanted one to just you know pass around so everybody could look. But um, uh, the stats that I got were mainly from The Economist, which is like super neoliberal, it's like super pro-capitalist. And I think a better one is the U.S. Census Bureau, because they do great sociological data without any, you know, denouncing them of association just because they fight for the, you know, U.S. imperialism or whatever. So, uh, yeah, are there any more questions? Does anybody have any, like, last remarks? Awesome. Thanks guys, this is our